Scripture today is found in Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know that you, that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that the day may come up on you unawares. So for us a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted a worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading. Father, guide us by your Spirit as we interpret your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take heed, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. Interesting. The day of Jesus will come upon you unexpectedly. The cares of this life can be something as simple as just trying to make a living. Running the kids to soccer practice. All the different things that you have to do. But the thing that makes me a little nervous about it is it's thrown in there in the company of carousing and drunkenness. <laughs> so I guess it's not just the drunkards that need to worry or the carousers, but those of us who have a lot of cares and who are burdened down financially and other ways. And we let the cares of this life dominate our life and become the sole focus of our life. And this is going to come as a snare, it says. So the cares of this life are a snare that comes upon us unexpectedly. And uh, we're to watch, therefore. Watch out that we don't fall into these patterns and pray always that you may be able to be counted worthy to escape all these things. So the end times are coming. And our remedy is not just to study about the end times. I've known some people in the Adventist church that that's all they did. I had one guy in one of the churches I was at, all he wanted to talk about in every Sabbath school class and in every single church service was the time of trouble. And he talked about the time of trouble so much that he became a troublemaker. <laughs> and as I reasoned with him, I tried to say, hey, how much time do you spend praying? And he said he spent less than five minutes a day. And I said, you need to spend less time studying and more time praying. You need to be a balanced Christian and a balanced person. The devil always takes that which God has given as a blessing and he twists it and turns it into a curse. Think about the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden during creation week. Well, last week in my sermon, we talked about the skull and how the skull was made in the image of God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that the skull was created in creation week, like the Sabbath was. Now, the Sabbath was given as a blessing to us, wasn't it? But hasn't Satan taken something that God gave as a blessing and turned it into something that could be considered a counterfeit? There's a Sabbath that's blessed by God, and there's a Sabbath that's blessed by the papacy. And the papal Sabbath is on Sunday, and God's Sabbath is on Saturday. But just because they have stolen one of God's symbols, one of God's gifts to us, the Sabbath, and turned it into something that is never intended God, never intended to be, Sunday worship, just as God has taken the skull, and made it one of the most unbelievable things, made in the image of God, 
that holds our brain and our mind where we have our relationship with God, and yet the devil has taken this and turned it into a symbol of evil. Do we accept that false symbol of evil in the Sabbath regard? That false symbol does not reflect on God's Sabbath. And that false symbol does not reflect on the, the skull of man. Because as we learned in the Bible, the word skull is what Calvary means. The very word Calvary, cranion in the Bible, the word the Bible uses for Calvary means skull. That was a Christian symbol for thousands of years, and then the devil took it and twisted it. Well, I don't accept what the devil does, do you? Now, today we have prayer, just like the Sabbath, just like the symbolism that I talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. We also have prayer. And people today take prayer and they twist it and turn it into something God never intended it to be. Now, those of you who send your children to a Christian school are blessed because I want you to know this week I went through the Steps to Christ chapter with your children on prayer. And we had such a wonderful experience learning about prayer, and I learned so many wonderful things that I had to share some of it with you today. And we're going to look at that chapter. If you have Steps to Christ, I want to encourage you to read Steps to Christ, The Privilege of Prayer, this week. I'm going to share some highlights with you in the sermon today that I hope will motivate you. And I want the kids here today. I want Slayton and Brenton and, and uh, Jessica and Ryan and all the kids that are at the children's church. If they're not in the church school, I want you to know we care just about as much for your children as we do for our children who are in the church school. I'm able to access them more easily. But those of you that have kids that aren't in the church school, Grab a copy of Steps to Christ and have your kids read it with you on the privilege of prayer, that chapter. It's fantastic, and it will do something for your children. It will encourage your children and help them to know how to pray. Now, Jesus makes it clear that we shouldn't allow the cares of this life to keep us from praying, that that would be a snare, a trap. Think of a bear trap with the great big teeth and you put your foot in it and it goes, <coughs> you know. That's a snare that the devil has. The cares of this life, drunkenness, all these different things, carousing, and it's like a bear trap. And you put your foot in it, <coughs> you know, and then you can't get out of it. The cares of this life, even if they're good things, can keep you from prayer. And it can be a snare. And Christ can come upon you unaware because you're not living a prayer-filled, prayerful life. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's look at the Bible. And if you're a fast page turner, you might be able to keep up with me. But in our verse for today, Luke 21, 36, it says, Watch ye, therefore, excuse me, and pray always. Now, how are we counted worthy to escape the trials and the punishment? The only way to be worthy is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, correct? The only perfection we have as sinners is we are perfectly corrupt. We are perfectly sinful. That we are perfectionists in. And uh, in our Sabbath school class, we talked a little bit about the fact that the only way the 144,000 are perfect is in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, in The Great Controversy, Ellen White writes about the 144,000, and she says they realize they are sinful, they realize the sinfulness of their lives, and their only hope is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they're supposed to be the perfect people, okay? But their only hope is in Christ's righteousness. You're a perfect sinner. Your only hope is in Christ. And if you think you're going to someday be good enough that when Christ steps out of the sanctuary, you're going to be home free because you're perfect. You're believing a lie of the devil, all right? The only way when Christ steps out of that sanctuary you're perfect is if you have the white robe of his righteousness upon you. Uh, that's a sermon for another day, but there's a, a lot of quotes in the Spirit of Prophecy that talk about, until the day our body is changed from this corrupt body to the incorruptible, 
we will have carnal nature to battle with. And that until Christ comes, the carnal nature is not removed. So that's why you have to be covered by Christ's righteousness to the moment he comes again, or you cannot be saved. And don't try to rely on your own strength or your own power. Now, we are told in these verses here, we are not to let the cares of this life keep us from the discipline of prayer. Prayer is one of the most important disciplines the Christian has to master. And we are far too casual far too often with prayer. We are admonished to pray always. What does that mean? So that we can be worthy only through the righteousness of Christ. And we are admonished to faithfully practice the discipline of prayer. Now, Jesus Christ himself gave us an example to follow. He demonstrated by his actions and not his words only how important the discipline of prayer is. In uh, Mark 6, 46, it says he departed into a mountain to pray. In Luke 6, 12, it says it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer. So Jesus was a man of prayer. He had a special place on a mountainside where he would go and he would pray. And it may be talking there about the Mount of Olives. He had a special place. And I can see why. The Mount of Olives is beautiful. The olive trees make a beautiful setting for prayer. And it's just gorgeous there. I've been there four or five times. And it's just fantastic. Um, It's a place that is holy and inspires reverence. And that was Jesus' favorite place. He used to like to go to that mountain. And he used to have prayer. And sometimes he would pray all night and then witness all day. And how did he do that? Because prayer enlivens the soul, strengthens the body, and heals the mind. Prayer is like placing yourself in a phone charger. You know when your cell phone is dead and you plug it into the charger? Prayer is like plugging your mind into God's heavenly charger. And it rejuvenates you. Jesus may have been run down when he went to that mountain, but after praying all night, he had his plug plugged into the power of God and his phone was into the charger And when he turned the phone back on in the morning, it was fully charged and ready to go. When you come to prayer meeting, I've had people tell me, Pastor, I barely drug myself here. I was so tired, I didn't want to come tonight, but the Holy Spirit just made me come. And I'm so glad he did, because I was tired and exhausted when I came, but now I feel rejuvenated and much better. I'm excited about what we learned tonight And I feel rejuvenated. He said it was so weird to come to prayer meeting exhausted and tired and go away rejuvenated and invigorated. And I said, no, it isn't. That's what God does. When you put yourself in touch with the Word of God, and what do we do at prayer meeting? We do two things. We pray and we read the Word of God. And when you plug your mind into the Word of God, things happen. Your battery gets recharged. You get reinvigorated, rejuvenated. Now, in Luke 11, verse 2, it says, and this is one of Leon's favorite uh, passages, and he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. So Jesus, they call this the Lord's Prayer. I think it should be called the Disciples' Prayer because it was really what the disciples were supposed to pray. But the first thing he says, when you uh, say, our Father... When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. So first, you have to believe that God's in heaven. You have to believe he exists. You have to believe that God is there when you pray and that he's going to hear you. And it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. So when we pray, it's not to bring God down to us. It's to bring us up to God. And it's to reinvigorate and change our attitude so that we go forth from our secret prayer, our time in the cocoon with God, 
being metamorphosized from the caterpillars we are into the butterfly of grace. We go into that cocoon of prayer, and we're in that cocoon. And the longer we're into the cocoon, the more beautiful our wings are. So if you want to soar with the eagles instead of crawling on your belly with the caterpillars, you need to get in the cocoon of prayer. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck being a caterpillar your whole life. You're going to be crawling in the dirt like a snake when you could be flying, soaring like the butterflies and the eagles do. Get in the cocoon of prayer and let God metamorphosize you. Let him change you. Let him reinvigorate you. God will make you a different person. I like the saying, don't look for me in my past. I don't live there anymore. I have relatives and family that can only see the person they saw 25 years ago. Do you have any people like that in your family? They can't understand that God has changed you and that you're not the same person you were 25 years ago. Well, prayer does that. It changes you into the image of God. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. When you look outside at a mountain, what do you see? A sanctuary or just some dirt? You know, both men were trapped behind prison bars. Looking out the window, one saw mud and the other stars. What do you see when you look to God? Do you have a closet at home that's a sanctuary for you to go and pray and pour your heart out to God? You need to have a place. If it's in your bed or if it's at your bed or at the foot of your bed, you need to have a sacred place that you dedicate to God, a little sanctuary somewhere. It can be in your garden. It can be on a mountain like Jesus. Uh, Instead of seeing mud, you, you need to see the stars. And if you're always down here on earth and letting the cares of this life gobble up all your thoughts and all your time, how are you ever going to be heavenly minded? You have to get your attention focused up into the sanctuary in heaven. And you have to pray to God and spend time in prayer or your life will never change. You'll be so tied up in the cares of this life that the day will come upon you unawares. And what a tragedy that would be. Two weeks ago, I talked to you about a symbol. Now when I look at that symbol, I see the catacombs. I see the Christians. I see Ezekiel 37, where the dry bones were a symbol of the resurrection. When I see a skull now, I see Calvary. I see the resurrection. I see freedom. I see a symbol of our deliverance like the Jews of old who held the skull as a sacred symbol that one day God would raise them up on the last day. When I see the word skull, I think Calvary, because that's where the word skull comes from. The wonderful thing is it comes from that in several languages. In the Latin, it's, it's cranium. I have to pronounce it kind of weird. In the Greek, it's cranium. True, it's Golgotha. Have you ever heard of that? Whenever I see one now, I think of Calvary. I think of the cross. I think of the resurrection. I think of freedom from sin. I'm not going to let the devil take something that God created in his image and corrupt it and abuse it and misuse it. No, that belongs to God. You can't have it. The Sabbath belongs to God. You can't have it. You can call Sunday the Sabbath all you want. I'll say this, let every man be a liar. God is true. Sunday is not Sabbath. There's only one Sabbath, and that's the seventh day of the week. And I'm not just being a legalist. It's a symbol of my salvation. Just like a skull is a symbol of Calvary to me, the Sabbath is a symbol of my salvation. I am resting in Christ and in his works, not in my own works. And by keeping the Sabbath, I'm saying I'm resting in the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. 
I rest in the Sabbath because the work is done and my Savior has done it. And I'm resting in Him. That's why I keep the Sabbath, not just because I'm arguing with people about which day. If that's all you can see, you're not seeing much. The beauty of the Sabbath is it's a symbol of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we're saved by His works and not ours. That's the beauty of it. And that's what I love to think about. When I look at Jesus, he says he wants the will of God done as it is in heaven on earth. How am I going to have the will of God done in my life if I never spend time in heaven? The way we bring heaven down to the earth is to go to heaven through prayer and then bring that atmosphere down to earth and permeate it in our homes and with everyone we meet. In Mark eleven twenty four, it says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. It's interesting. There is a great storehouse in heaven, and God has given you a key that will open the door of that storehouse and pour you out a blessing you don't have room to receive, and yet we take that key and we stick it in a drawer and go there once or twice a month and get that key out. Some people once or twice a year. Some people just leave the key sit there permanently. Now in John 17, 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So through the word of God, if you believed in Jesus Christ through the writings of the apostles, Jesus prayed for you. Now, did all of you come to Christ through the writings of the apostles? Then Jesus prayed for you personally. Think about that. Jesus instructed us to pray always because he knew how easily human beings get distracted by the cares of this life. He not only said to pray but to watch and pray. And he even prayed for you and I personally so that we would not fail. Thank you, Jesus, for praying for me. That's impossible. No, it's not. He prayed for me. Doesn't matter what you think of me or what anyone else thinks of me. What really matters is what God thinks of me. And when he looks at me, he sees his son standing in my place. And he thinks of me as a person who has never sinned. That's grace. And that is amazing. He warned us that our carnal nature is weak and that we would need to be faithful and disciplined in our prayer life. We have to watch. Now, what are we watching out for? Let me tell you something. You need to watch out for yourself more than anyone else. Because the greatest enemy of your spiritual life is your own carnal nature. And that carnal nature will subtly turn your feet away from what God wants for you and have you going in the opposite direction and you won't even realize it's happening. The greatest enemy is within, not without. And prayer is like taking nails and nailing the carnal nature to the cross. That's why prayer is so important. He warned us about our carnal nature and that we would need to be disciplined. Watch yourself. Watch because temptation is coming from within and without. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Will your flesh always be weak? Sadly, yes, your flesh will be weak. But your spirit can be strong in Christ Jesus. The carnal nature can be subdued and nailed to that cross and even though it will occasionally cause you pain and, and maybe get you a little bit, you can, for in large part, even though it remains, you can keep it from reigning in your life. God can give you victory over any sin, and no matter what you've done, God has forgiveness for you. So watch and pray, and in Mark 26, 41, that ye enter not into temptation. I never pray for God to help me to overcome the temptation. I always pray for God to keep me from the temptation.
I don't want to have to have God help me when I'm in the middle of a fierce temptation. I would much rather have him lead me not into it in the first place. If you've got a problem with alcohol and there's a bar down a certain street on the way home from work, don't go down that street. Lead us not into temptation. If you know when you talk to a certain relative, they lead you into sin, then maybe you need to not talk to that relative. If you have certain friends that are leading you to hell, then maybe you need to get some new friends. Lead us not into temptation. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Luke 22, 46. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Wake up, Laodicea, why sleep ye? Sleeping in church, sleeping in the home, sleeping at work, but I'm tired, pastor. Can't come to prayer meeting, I'm tired, I have to go home and go to bed. Sleeping, even at work, when you should take heed and watch and pray, Are you just living in a daze? Are you in a fog? A lackadaisical, lukewarm Christian? Do you pray? Do you pray earnestly? Or are you just sleeping through your life? Well, I'll tell you what. A life that's not invigorated, illuminated, and filled with Jesus Christ through communion with God and through prayer is not a life that's worth living. Now, you can live that kind of life. Why? When God wants to give you joy and give you life more abundant. He wants to give you a life that's exciting, a life that's positive. Some poor folks, all they see is the mud. They never see the stars. They see the mud in everybody else's life. They're always talking to me about this one doing something they shouldn't and that one that they shouldn't. They're not talking to me about the stars. They're like some of them have never even mentioned Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his salvation one time. All they're talking about is the mud. This one's doing wrong. That one's doing wrong. That one over there's doing wrong. That that single adult over there, or that mother with kids, or that child in the school. And they're experts in all the faults of, their, of others. And I've noticed these people are even experts in their own faults. But it says in Steps to Christ, and you can read it, it says there that when we focus on the faults of others or even our own faults, that that is a device of the devil to turn our eyes from Christ And thus, by separating us from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory over us. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. Sick of being a lukewarm Christian with a lukewarm life? Is it fun taking a lukewarm bath? Well, it might be good if you've been dirty for a long time, and any water might be good water. But... It feels a lot better if it's nice and hot, doesn't it? That's why Jesus said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be hot or cold. Either either walk away and say, you don't want anything to do with me or be passionate for me. But don't just be lukewarm about it. If you've rejected me, at least I have a chance to maybe wake you up someday. But if you're just playing church, I'm Christian, I'm going to vomit you. Now that's disgusting. That's a regurgitation scenario that I don't think I want to be involved in, do you? Yuck. Why? Because you're neither hot nor cold. You think you're okay. You think you have lots of good works, but you're foul. You don't have my white robe. You need to repent. Interesting. Luke 18, 1. He spake a parable. Unto this end, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And then he tells the story of a woman with the unjust judge, and she goes to this judge. He 
turns her down. But does she give up? No, she's back the next day. Turns her down again. Does she quit? No, she's back the next day. Does she quit? No, she's back the next day. And Jesus says, men are always to pray like this woman. I told you this story because you should never give up and faint not. When you pray, don't give up. Keep praying. And when God sees you really mean it and you really want it, then maybe he'll give you what you're praying for. But people sometimes just pray and then they give up. They don't really stand firm. They're not faithful. They don't keep praying. They say a little quick prayer and that's it, out the door. No, Jesus is saying don't be this way. And then he says, you ought to be like this woman who just bugged the judge till it made him crazy and finally he gave her what she wanted. Now, I think that's funny. I think that's really funny that Jesus tells you to bug God until he gives you what you want. You know, don't quit. Don't faint. Watch. Men ought always to pray. Now, how do you pray always? You know, that? what's that mean? Luke 8, 18, 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? God's elect are crying day and night unto the Lord. Do you want to make it through the last days? Do you want to be one of those people like the 144,000 that stand on the sea of glass? Then cry day and night before the Lord. Let's crank up our prayer lives and become the people God wants us to be. I want you to be filling out that survey because it's important. And I want you to be honest about it when you do it. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee prayed a sickening, judgmental prayer of condemnation. I thank you I'm not like him because I pray and I do everything right. You ever notice some people think they're always the smartest person in the room and they always want to do all the talking and they always think that they're right and everybody else is wrong. Well, guess what? That person is really quite a self-centered person. Because if you do all the talking and don't let anybody else say a word, what's that make you? Pretty self-centered, doesn't it? If you don't let the other people say anything and you just think you're way smarter than them so you monopolize all the time, what's that say? I think I'm better than you. I think I know more than you. I think I'm above you. Now that was the Pharisee's attitude. I'm holier than you because I know more, I study more, I'm smarter than you. For whatever reason he thought it, he thought he was the smartest person in the room and everybody else was stupid. What did that publican say, though? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't argue with the Pharisee. He could have turned to the Pharisee and said, you made some very good points. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the Pharisee might have been right about everything he was saying. But is he the judge? Does he have a right to judge other people? What makes him think he can judge you? He's got some sick, twisted theology up in his brain that makes him think he's the smallest guy in the room and he has the right to judge you. But when Jesus looked at the situation, who did Jesus say went home justified? The publican. What did he say? I'm the dumbest person in the room. No. Lord have mercy on me because I'm almost perfected. No. A sinner. Lord, have mercy on me because I used to be a sinner. Is that what he said? No. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And he went home with mercy. Amen. He got the mercy, and the self-righteous one went home condemned. And the condemned went home righteous. Does that sound fair to you? And I will guarantee you when that Pharisee got home, he didn't feel... Guilty about it at all. He felt like he was totally right, justified, and that they were all wrong. Patted himself on the back for being so smart. And probably told himself, I really put that publican in his place today. 
But Jesus showed you how God looks at it. What does God want? He wants us to pray. And he wants us to pray humbly, not proudly. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Have you ever felt like, Pastor, I don't know what to pray for. I don't even know how to pray. That's okay. The Bible says we don't really know how we ought to pray. But then it says, The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You don't have to worry about it. You just try. You just do your best. You just talk to God as you would with a friend and pour your heart out to Him and communicate with Him all day long. And it doesn't matter. You can be babbling stupidity. And the Spirit will take that babbling stupidity and turn it into an eloquent prayer request. By the time it gets to God, you sound like a, a, a fluent speaker. You know, your prayer will be eloquently phrased to the Father. You never have to worry about what to say. You can just pour your heart out and God will take what you say. The Holy Spirit will interpret it through Jesus to the Father and it will be a masterpiece. So don't worry. We're told that we don't even know what to pray for, and that's true. Even with our limitations as sinners, we are told to constantly direct our minds heavenward and to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Why? Because prayer brings us up to God. It doesn't bring him down to us. It directs our minds heavenward, and the Holy Spirit takes our speech, cleans it up, and presents it to God through Christ. Now, Men ought always to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 puts it this way. Pray without ceasing. Interesting. How do we do that? We are to be in a continual attitude of prayer. We are to have our cell phone open with the speaker phone on just in case God wants to text us a message. Or give us a call. 1 Timothy 2.8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Okay, those of you angry Christians, without wrath, pray and ask God to help you to be more tolerant of others and less angry. Okay? It's that whole attitude that we're right as Seventh-day Adventists and everybody else is wrong that makes us angry sometimes. And we get angry at our relatives and people we witness to that don't get what we're saying, and we act like it's their fault. And we're angry. We're to lift up holy hands unto God. Now, how do they become holy? By accepting the righteousness of Christ. And we're to lift our hands up when we pray. Now, so when Debbie and Linda and a few others raise their hand in the sanctuary and praise the Lord, and you all look at them and think they're weird, no, they're actually doing what the Bible says to do. So don't don't criticize them. They're not weird. They're actually doing what the Bible says to do, even though they're not men. Doesn't it say, 1 Timothy 2.8, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Don't doubt. God's going to answer your prayer. And don't be mad at God, and don't be mad at your fellow man. Get rid of the wrath. Don't doubt. Lift up your hands. Praise the Lord and pray to God. Okay? Now, some people pray like this. Some people pray like this. I can show you examples in the Bible of both. I don't care. You can look up. You can look down. You can open your eyes. You can close your eyes. Just pray. Just do it. Like Nike says, just do it. We are to pray everywhere. Everywhere. At all times. Often. Frequently. Daily, are you doing that? James 5, 13, he's sick among you or afflicted. Let him pray. When you get sick, first thing you should do is pray. Not the last thing. You don't stay sick for two weeks, and then when you're ready to go into the hospital and die, start praying. When you first feel bad, pray. Is there any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is there any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. If you really get sick, call for the elders. We can come and anoint you and pray for you. The Bible says to pray. James 5.16, confess your faults to one another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we read that verse, pray for one another that ye may be healed, and we think we're praying for them so they can be healed. It's not what it says. It says we're to pray for one another so that we can be healed. What do we need to be healed of? Our self-centeredness. The fact that you rarely pray for anyone else but yourself might indicate that you're a self-centered person. And God is saying, it's not good enough just to pray for me or to me. You need to pray for one another so that you can stamp out that selfishness that cares only about yourself. It says when you pray for other people, you're healing yourself. Man. We all need that, don't we? I covet your prayers, and I'm so happy that some of you, many of you, tell me you pray often for me. And I covet that because I've been changing the last eight years against my will because sneaky church members are turning me into someone else. And they always say, if you don't like your preacher, pray for the one you got, and God will give you a new one. We are to pray for one another, not so they can be healed, but so we can. Let God take away your self-centeredness by turning your eyes to Him. 1 Timothy 5.25 Brethren, pray for us. Paul admonishes his flock to pray for him and his fellow workers. We are supposed to pray for the leaders of our church. It's our Christian duty. All the elders, the Sabbath school superintendents, all of our leaders need prayer. Amen? Amen? We are to pray every day, all the time, often. Yes, we are. David prayed every day in Psalm 5.3. He said, My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. So if you want to look up when you pray, it's okay. In the Middle East, they would often pray, looking up to heaven. And so, every morning, start your day with prayer. Look up to God and pray. And then in Psalm 54, too, Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. Psalm 66, 20, Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Psalm 102, 1. Psalm 143, 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me in thy righteousness. Not in my righteousness, but in thy righteousness. So every day we are to pray. We are to pour our hearts out to God. Psalm 86, 3, Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Psalm 88, 9, Mine eye mourned by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily unto thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. We get a picture of David crying out to God, pouring out his heart, praying every day, looking up with his hands outstretched, imploring God to forgive him for his sins, to clothe him in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus instructed us to take up our cross daily and follow him. He gave us the example of daily prayer. And if we want to be a powerful Christian, we need to pray earnestly and daily. And Jesus said to them all, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, as I was studying with the church school kids, I came across some really interesting comments. 
And everything I'm going to read to you, everything I'm going to share, and, and they're short, but they're sweet, I got them out of Steps to Christ, page 93 to 104, but it's simply the chapter called The Privilege of Prayer. And all of you can get a Steps to Christ. If you don't have one, we have them in the study. In order to commune with God, we must have something to say to Him concerning our actual life. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. God wants you to share with Him your actual life. When Jesus was upon earth, He taught His disciples how to pray. He directed them to present their daily needs before God. What are your needs every day? God wants to hear it. He wants to know it. You're to tell God that. All right? If the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer? What do you think about that statement? How much more should feeble, sinful mortals? Are you a feeble, sinful mortal? then you need to feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer. Fervent, mean it, put your heart into it. Don't just do it in a lackluster way. Have some passion toward God. And then not only fervent, but constant, all day long, letting our thoughts and our hearts go out to God. Now here's a cool one. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. Let's say that together. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. And yet there is manifest reluctance on our part to make known our wants to God. What a wonder that we pray so little. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings Now, she's talking about Christians here. Sinful mortals, poor, humble human beings. That's what God thinks of you. That's what you are. Wake up. Get off the delusions of grandeur and acknowledge you are a sinful mortal and that the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children, and yet there is much reluctance. Listen to this. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings? You're sinful, you're helpless, and you're poor. Okay? Admit it, like the publican. I'm sinful, I'm helpless, I'm poor. Help me. All right? Pray. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who pray so little and have so little faith? The angels regard communion with God as their highest joy. And yet the children of earth who need so much help that God alone can give seem satisfied to walk without the companionship of his presence. The angels are thinking, what's wrong with you people? Why don't you pray? Listen to this. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. You wonder why sometimes you're so depressed that you want anti-depression medication? You wonder sometimes why the darkness is closing in all around you? Let me give you the answer. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin. And it is all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Wow. Sometimes I fall into temptation. Why? Just like the apostles, I'm sleeping when I should be praying. Amen? Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Seek every opportunity to go where prayer is wont to be made. 
those who are really seeking for communion with God will be seen in the prayer meeting. Ouch. Did you wear your steel-toed boots today? Got your steel-toed shoes on? I have mine on, and my feet still hurt. <laughs> Seek every opportunity to go where prayers want to be made. Those who are really seeking for communion with God will be seen in the prayer meeting. We should pray in the family circle, with our families. And above all, we must not neglect secret prayer, for this is the life of the soul. If you have no secret prayer, you have no life in your soul. If you're neglecting secret prayer, you have no life of the soul. Secret prayer is the life of the soul. Pray in your closet, and as you go about your daily labor, let your heart be often lifted to God, uplifted to God. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. Prayers rise like precious incense before the throne of grace. Ready for this? Satan cannot overcome him whose heart is stayed upon God. Want to know why you're not overcoming the devil when he comes at you? Satan cannot overcome him whose heart is stayed upon God. There is no time or place in which it is inappropriate to offer up a petition to God. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. Anything that shakes your peace or upsets you, he wants to hear about. It. He wants you to talk it over with him. Should we be doing these things I'm talking about here? Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. The life must be like Christ's life, between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become formal and routine. She's not saying you should be a monk and hide in the closet. You're supposed to get off your seat, on your feet, out into the world, and pray while you're walking. Pray at the red light. Pray when you're giving Bible studies. Pray when you're down at the center. You're to have an attitude of prayer all the time. But not be a monk locked up in some monastery, but be out there in the world. Go from the mountain to the multitude and minister in Christ's name. Listen to this. We sustain loss when we neglect the privilege of associating together to strengthen and encourage one another in the service of God. It says here that we are to come to church that we are go to prayer meeting, that we are to spend time with each other. And it says, when we neglect the privilege of associating together, we sustain loss. Some people have asked me, well, do I need to come to church every week? Yes, you do. Why? Because you are going to lose if you don't. Not for me, but for yourself. You need to be in church every week. And it goes on. In our association as Christians, we lose much by the lack of sympathy we have for one another. He who shuts himself up unto himself is not fulfilling the position that God designed he should. God doesn't want us all isolated by ourselves. Especially on Sabbath, he wants us together as a family. And when we don't go to these things, we are the ones who are losing. Our devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. We are too sparing of giving praise and thanks. We are the constant recipients of God's mercy. Yet how little gratitude we express. How little we praise him for what he has done. We must gather about the cross. Christ and him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God. And when we realize his great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. Isn't that beautiful? The soul may ascend heaven on the wings of praise. Why do we sing praise songs? So we can ascend to heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above 
and as we express our gratitude, we are approximating the worship of the heavenly host. Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth God. Perseverance in prayer has made, been made a condition of receiving. We must pray always if we would grow in grace and experience. We are to be instant in prayer, to continue in prayer, to watch in the same with thanksgiving. Uh, Romans 12, 12 and Colossians 4, 2. Peter exhorts believers to be sober, to watch unto prayer. Paul directs, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. But ye, beloved, says Jude, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now you have that survey, and I'd just like you to fill it in. Hebrews 11.6 is the last text I'm going to share with you. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So why are you so reluctant to pray? Why do you pray so little? What is it that's holding you back? As you do the survey, be honest, be ruthless with yourself. Are you ha <clears throat> happy with your prayer experience? <clears throat> Are you willing to improve your prayer life? Are you willing to consider the things that we're suggesting? Are you willing to make a commitment to God to be more prayerful and more faithful? How much time do you spend a day in prayer? What are the scheduled times you pray? How would you characterize your attitude about prayer? Are you satisfied with the results? Have your prayers been answered? Is there passion in your life? In your prayer life? Do you have a special place, a family prayer altar? Have you ever shared your thoughts with your family on prayer? What happens, what needs to happen in your prayer life to change your life for the better? Are you willing to do those things now? And then there's some prayer decisions there. I'd like you to check the ones that apply to you. And then after the benediction and the closing prayer and the service is over, before you come back and shake my hand, what I'd like you to do is find someone here in the sanctuary to show your survey to, and I would like you to have prayer with that person. All right? Thank you very much. Let's sing Sweet Hour of Prayer. And that prayer you have with that person will be your benediction to go forth and be a better person because you are going to be a praying person. Number 478, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Just hum softly. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness incur, engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word, and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer. 
Let's read it together. Hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share. Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height, I view my home and take my flight. In my immortal flesh, I'll rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Father in heaven, bless these your people as they endeavor to have a more productive, more fervent, more passionate, more constant, more disciplined prayer life. Father, we have to master these disciplines, the basics of Christianity, Bible study and prayer in order to stand in the last days. May you give them special grace that will change their life forever and make their prayer life deeper and better than it has ever been before. And we all pray this, including the messenger today. In Jesus' name, amen.